Alright, so this is the video for the 1.5 notes on infinite limits and limits at infinity. So first we're going to look at this function, f of x equals 3 over x minus 2, and we know that this function has a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. And so what that means is on the left side, the graph is going down, so as x approaches 2 from the left, f of x is actually approaching negative infinity. And on the right side, we have a positive infinity. And this right here is how you wrote this in Algebra 2 and definitely pre-calculus. We now know these as limits, so we can just write the same thing. The limit equals negative infinity and infinity. And we call this without bound or unbounded or an infinite limit. All right, this still means that the limit it does not the limit does not exist, okay? These are still technically limits that don't exist, but we're going to be more specific and go ahead and say infinity and negative infinity at this point from here on out. Okay? This limit fails to exist and that's what infinity means. It's not a number exactly, it's more of an idea. And so when we're given these equations like number 1, um and not a graph, we could graph this. That would be okay. But what we need to do is just think of a number. If I'm trying to do the limit as x approaches 1, because that's where the vertical asymptote is, as x approaches 1 from the left, let's think about if we were to plug in a number just barely less than 1, like 0 0.999. If I were to plug that in for this x, I would have a negative value. That's how you know that the left-sided limit's negative infinity. Likewise, the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, we could plug in a number just barely more than 1, like 1.001. That, when you subtract 1, would give you positive, so we have positive infinity. So as long as you know there's a vertical asymptote, you're really only just determining positive or negative. Okay, so again, on B, we have the vertical asymptote at x equals 1. So when I'm trying to find the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of this function, and I plug in a 0.99, this time I square it, so it's positive infinity, and so will the right-sided limit. In fact, everything you plug in for x, because you're squaring, will give you um, positive. And so these limits right around the vertical asymptote, both positive infinity. Okay, so now on C and D, we're given some graphs, and these are always a little bit easier. I like to go ahead and draw in the vertical asymptote, and this left-sided limit, the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x, if it's going up, it's positive infinity. The limit as x approaches 1 from the right, well, that's going down, so that's negative infinity and that's where using the graphs is easier. On D, we have going down, so the left-sided limit would be negative infinity and the right-sided limit would be negative infinity. Kind of like B, they're the same in this case. Okay, so we have this statement right here that we used in Algebra 2 and in pre-calculus. If f of x is approaching infinity or negative infinity as x approaches C from the left or the right, then the line x equals c is a vertical asymptote, which we've already talked about. Okay? So now we're just going to practice finding these vertical asymptotes. You do that by setting the denominator equal to zero. A vertical asymptote happens, well, one reason when it happens is because you have a number over zero. It's supposed to be a zero. All right, so we would do 2 parenthesis x squared minus 1 equals 0. And then from here, maybe we could divide out that 2. Then I have x squared minus 1 equals 0. Then maybe add the 1. There's other ways to solve this. But when you square root both sides, we get, oops, we get, um, I want that squared there. We get x equals 1, and we get x equals negative 1. You can't forget that when you square root both sides, you get a plus minus. On b, something more interesting happens. When you take x squared plus 16 and set it equal to 0, and you subtract 16, I end up taking square root of a negative. Now remember, these are imaginary numbers. Well, in calculus, we really don't deal with imaginary numbers, 
hardly ever, definitely not right now, and so we just get to say there's no vertical asymptotes. We don't have to worry about the imaginary, this solution for x has an imaginary solution, but since it's not a real number, there's no vertical asymptotes. All right, for c, we've got to remember something about cotangent. Cotangent looks like this. It starts with an asymptote. It's a decreasing function. There's another asymptote, and the period is pi. So every asymptote you have is pi apart. So there'd be one here at 0, another one at pi, another one at 2 pi, 3 pi, so on. So we can just write a general answer, x equals pi n. All right, d, you may be thinking, just set the denominator equal to 0. But we've got to watch out for something, and that are whole, that's holes. So we've got to go ahead and factor both the numerator and the denominator. Because if a term cancels, then I need to know that. Because that's not a vertical asymptote, that's a whole. So that definitely happens here. So if you don't watch out for this, you might think there's two vertical asymptotes, but really there's only one from right there, and that's x equals negative 2. So down here it says a vertical asymptote is a non-removable discontinuity, and a hole is a removable discontinuity. All this removable business just means cancels, or doesn't. So a vertical asymptote does not cancel. A hole does cancel. Okay? Limit exists at a hole, but it does not exist at an asymptote. So if we factor this new function, difference of squares makes x minus 3, x plus 3 over x plus 3. We get the x plus 3 part cancels. So that's a whole. That's a removable discontinuity at x equals negative 3. Well, what about vertical asymptotes? There's nothing left in the denominator. So there's actually no vertical asymptotes in this graph. Okay, so number 3 is interesting because it's just saying something's happening at 2, x equals 2. Is it a vertical asymptote or is it a removable discontinuity? Which again is the same as a whole. Well, again, one way to do this is just a factor. See if it cancels or not. x minus 2, x plus 2. In the denominator, um, x plus 5, x minus 2. So this time, x minus 2 cancels. Since x minus 2 cancel, you know, x minus 2 is the binomial that goes with x equals 2. Since it cancels, that's a whole. So which one is it? It's a removable dust continuity or whole. Another way to have done this would be to actually just plug in 2 and find f of 2. If you get 0 over 0, again, that points to a whole. And I'm going to switch colors here just to show you. It's not happening in this one, but let's say on another problem you get a number over 0, any number other than 0. That's when you know you have a vertical asymptote. All right, we already talked about vertical asymptotes. Now let's talk about horizontal asymptotes. The reason these are important is because this has to do with end behavior, and this is actually a phrase you should have heard at some point having to do with horizontal asymptotes. They're what happens at the end of the graph. So we don't really care about the middle. The horizontal asymptotes were those things that happened on the ends. That's why the graph could cross um, a horizontal asymptote in the middle, and we didn't really care about it. It's because they only affect the ends. Now you may have heard a rhyme, or you may have memorized rules or cases or something about long division, but and if that works for you, great. If not, I'm just going to show you one other thing. Bobo, Botten, Betsy. And these are the three cases. So first of all, there's a little typo. That should be a 3x squared on the denominator of case 1. So you want to look at the degrees. The degree of the numerator is 1. The degree of the denominator is 2. So since the degree of the denominator is bigger, this has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0 by rule. I think it was low over high, 0 equals y. But this is also BOBO, bigger on bottom, 0. That's what BOBO stands for. So if the horizontal asymptote of this is y equals 0, then the limit as x approaches infinity is also 0. Okay? So case 2, here we have the degree on top is 2, the degree on bottom is 1. This is a bigger on top. This is the bottom. Okay? If you remember that when the degree on top is bigger, 
there's no slant asymptote. I mean, so I just gave it away. There's no horizontal asymptote. In fact, there is a slant asymptote and you had to do long division to find it. So you could actually do long division here or really just think sensibly. What would happen if you plugged infinity in for x, a really large number in for x? You're going to get a really large number in return, which we'll call infinity. So this is another time when your limit can equal infinity, is when this is put out on the table, your limit could equal infinity. But just like before, this is implying that the limit does not exist. A limit towards infinity is not a limit like how it is towards a number. So, But we're going to go ahead and write infinity. This could equal negative infinity if there was a negative sign somewhere in here that would cause um, negative. Just use common sense. Think about if you plugged in a number, would it be positive? Would it be negative? So this last one, this one, I think the rhyme went um, coefficients, or I'm sorry, degrees are the same, play the coefficient game. So here the horizontal asymptote would be y equals two-thirds, and this is the Betsy. Betsy stands for bottom equals top coefficients. All right, so this limit equals two-thirds. Okay, so just in reviewing horizontal asymptotes, we've learned how to take limits as x approaches infinity. So it's not a totally new concept, it's just a new way of writing it. All right, now we have some problems to practice. All right, now, um, if you're watching this video because you were absent, I would just go ahead and pause it, try to do as many as I can, and then play the video. All right, on A, the coefficients, I'm sorry, I keep saying that, the degrees are the same, so we're going to look at the coefficients, and 3 divided by 9 is 1 third. And keep in mind, the only reason we can use these rules is because we're taking limits as x approaches infinity on each of these. This only happens here. Otherwise, we'd have to use our other rules for limits. All right, on b, the degree on bottom is bigger. That's going to make that 0. And C, the degree on top is bigger, so we got to use common sense. Is this infinity or negative infinity? Well, if you just think about plugging in a really large number, you get a really large number. Not negative, but positive. All right, D, it kind of appears that we don't know the degree on the bottom. We know the degree on top is 1. The degree on the bottom may seem to be 2, but remember, we're taking square root of x squared. So the degree on the bottom is 1. So, again, coefficients. 1 divided by 1 is 1. All right, then we get to E. Now, just as a sidebar, I want to talk about the range of sine and cosine. And I'm lumping these two together because we're going to have a sine here and a cosine there. The range of sine of cosine, if you think about the graph, all right, um, here's sine, and cosine, you know, is very similar. The range bottom to top is negative 1 to 1. This means you can take sine or cosine of any number you want, and it has to be less than or equal to 1. And it could be negative, so we could put absolute value bars there and everything. But it's never going to be a big number. It's, in fact, what we could call negligible. If you had, you know, infinity or a billion trillion minus 1, it wouldn't matter at all. So that's why I can cross it off. I could not have done this if this was x times cosine x, but because it's a minus, minus 1, minus negative 1, minus a half, what's the difference? So then we just divide the coefficients and we get 1. We can do the same thing on f. Plus sine x, well, the most you're going to be adding down there is a 1, which is nothing. All right, the coefficient on the the denominator is greater, so we get 0. Same thing here. I realize there's a 2 there, but even so, sine of 2 times something, the output is still only going to be 1 or negative 1 at most, whereas the denominator is going to be really big. So this becomes 0. Just in general, I want you to think small over big equals 0. This is not true in life. This is true when we're doing limits as x approaches infinity because small is really small and big is really big. When you take that ratio, especially as it gets smaller on top and bigger on bottom, you get zero. Likewise, if you flip these, you have a similar rule, but the exact opposite. 
When you have a really big number over a really small number, this is going to equal infinity or possibly negative infinity if the if the these numbers, one of them is negative.